Did a dog dewormer really cure cancer? We dig into the science versus the hype today. Have you heard the story about the man who says he beat stage four cancer using a cheap dog dewormer? Yeah. The story of Joe Tippins has been floating around the internet for years, since late 2017, early 2018. And it's convinced a lot of people that a medication for dogs is the miracle cure that Big Pharma supposedly doesn't want you to know about. But does data actually support that idea? Spoiler, it's really complicated, it's messy, and any simple answer is wrong. That's why the thumbnail for this video is a roller coaster. Today, we're breaking down what's real, what's missing, and what the research actually says. Hello, and welcome to Elevating Cancer Treatment, where we explain the science and debunk myths to help you navigate your health journey. My background is a little different. Beyond educating about cancer, I'm actually designing new drugs that are defining the future of oncology. This direct, hands-on experience offers me a very different perspective of how these cancer treatments work on the body, interact with the cancer cells, and cause side effects. And these are insights that I'm excited to share with you. If that sounds interesting, make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell so you never miss an update. And please share it if you find it useful. I'm Dr. Jay Chaplin. An important reminder, I'm a PhD, not an MD. The information in this video is education, and it's not medical advice. Every cancer is unique, and no general information applies to everyone. Please remember that. Always consult with your healthcare provider for guidance on your specific situation. And two quick things. First, as a thank you for being here, I've created a free resource, 10 Things to Elevate Your Chemo Journey, which you can download from the link below. And second, by signing up, you'll also get updates on that innovative cancer treatment I'm working on. I'm confident it represents a significant advancement in immunotherapy. So please take a moment, download your free guide, and join us in shaping the future of cancer treatment. Today, so. we're breaking down what's real, what's missing, and what the research actually says. What does it say about fenbendazole in cancer? It's a mess. Let's dig in. So, part one, the Joe Tippins story. So, Joe Tippins was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. It had metastasized throughout his entire body. It was bad. Apparently, the doctors told him, go home, get your stuff in order. The prognosis was very grim. And according to his own account, he started taking fenbendazole, that's a dog dewormer, and credits it with curing his cancer. He did that on the advice of a veterinarian friend of his. Now, here's the part many people skip over. At the exact same time that he began taking fenbendazole, he wasn't just still taking standard chemo, but he was also enrolled in an immunotherapy clinical trial for Keytruda, an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Now, Immunotherapy drugs like Keytruda are known to cause somewhere between 5 and 20% of people to have complete remissions in certain cancers, just all by themselves. Not the chemo, just the Keytruda. Gone. Cancer gone. But on the internet, that detail gets left out. Instead, the narrative becomes, dog dewormer cures cancer! The truth is, we don't know what caused his remission. He had multiple things going on at the same time. Could have been the chemo, could have been the Keytruda, could have been the fenbendazole, could have been all of them together, we don't know. But what we do know is that Keytruda has a scientifically proven track record and that fenbendazole does not. So part two, but it has a mechanism, and so do many other drugs. Fenbendazole does have a theoretical way that it can fight cancer. It interferes with microtubules, which are structural components inside cells, sort of like the skeleton of a cell. It sounds promising until you realize that we already have many approved, clinically tested, effectively managed microtubule targeting anti-cancer drugs. Some of the initial chemotherapy drugs are microtubule drugs like Taxol or Paclitaxel. There's also its relative, Docetaxel. There's Cabazitaxel, there's vincristine, there's venblastine, there's one more, um, demicolcine. So all of these work really well. They're all given by infusion, and we know how to manage them. And it's important that we know how to manage them because they all have very serious side effects. They're all hard to manage. They work, but they have serious side effects, and they have to be given by infusion. You can't just inject them. It causes problems. You can't take them orally, they get broken down in the stomach. Now, fenbendazole, however, it's 
taken by mouth. That's the way it's used as a dewormer because it doesn't get out of your gut. That's good for a dewormer. So while it works through the same sorts of mechanisms on microtubules and it should have the same side effects, it isn't absorbed well at all through the intestine. Usually only about 25%. And so to reach the plasma levels that you need for proven chemotherapies in these classes, it would need to be infused slowly. That's not how anyone reporting stories on YouTube is taking it. So even though huge doses can't get enough into your system to compensate for not infusing it. In other words, fenbendazole's mechanism is nothing new. It makes total sense. It could be hopeful. There are already drugs in use that do the same thing, but it can't reach effective levels in humans the way that people are taking it. So part three, let's take a look at the actual pharmacokinetics problem. How badly doesn't get it in, into the blood? So it's one thing to say that fenbendazole pills or powders shouldn't work, but what are the actual numbers? To reach that maximum plasma level of fenbendazole seen in all of the animal studies, mice, rats, dogs, non-human primates, that maximum of about 0.9 micrograms per milliliter, a human would need to take the equivalent of a 10 mg per kg dose every single day with food. So what does that mean? That's a dose of about four grams each and every day. And virtually all of the stories on the internet are dosing about 220 milligrams or one fifth of a gram every other day. That's a big difference. That's a tenfold difference. But even if you took that tenfold excess over what people report, the cancer cell death in lab studies requires one to 10 micrograms per milliliter for just slowing growth. That's barely achievable by the most sensitive cancers and the highest oral dose. And it takes 20 micrograms per milliliter or more to actually kill cancer cell lines. So even at huge impractical doses, fenbendazole never reaches the levels needed to kill cancer cells in humans. And that's what people report in these stories that they took fenbendazole and their cancer just disappeared, but no one can make that happen, even in a dish. So increasing the oral dose above four grams per day doesn't increase absorption. And fatty meals don't do it either. Those levels are already maximal and already account for the boost in absorption from taking it in food. This is a fundamental wall. You can't cure cancer with a drug that never enters your bloodstream at levels that would be required to do much of anything. So part four, but it works on the cell lines. It's true, but there's a catch. Yes, fenbendazole slows or kills cancer cells in culture dishes and at very high concentrations. But here's what people miss. Yeah, we already talked about the first part. These concentrations are far above what humans can absorb. Let's set that aside for the moment. The drug also requires liver metabolism to work. Fenbendazole doesn't do anything. It has to be converted in the liver to its active form. And that's something that these cultured cells in a flask don't have. They don't have a liver, it's just a cell. This is a real head scratcher for all of those cell line studies. Fenbendazole is not the active drug, but somehow it always works in the cell line studies. That's weird. Many of the successful in vitro results also used carrier solvents. To get that much into solution, you have to dissolve it in something else first. And those carrier solvents stress out the cell lines themselves, and they can't be used in humans. That's a major difference. So are these things promising in a Petri dish? Sure. Are they relevant to real human treatment? No. And here's where it starts to get really crazy and all collapses. Part five. What about the animal studies? This is where the hype goes completely off the rails. There have been five animal studies. I'm going to summarize each one of them because their quality is all over the map. All sorts of weird changes and assumptions. Just odd. The first study was an accidental one in 2012. Mice that were being set up for a cancer trial never developed the cancer and it might have been due to fenbendazole in the food or other issues with the food. So the researchers, being good researchers, went back and tested it. All right. When they repeated the experiment, they changed it significantly. By injecting the fenbendazole at massive doses, the human equivalent of four grams by injection. But for some reason, they only did three doses. Those are odd choices, and they don't mimic either their initial setup of daily in the food months on end to the way people use it at all. The results, and I quote, 
The growth of the tumors treated with fenbendazole alone was indistinguishable from that of control tumors. They also tried adding in radiation to see if the two combined would do anything more. Fenbendazole did nothing in that situation either. There was no effect on the tumors at all, even when injected with massive doses, but this was just a short burst not daily for long periods of time. So study two was done in 2018, and this one is problematic. It's human tumors, a non-small cell lung cancer tumor, in partially immunodeficient mice. Now, the cell culture results looked great as usual. Suppressed growth. The dosing was by food, and that's good, but it was also huge doses, the equivalent of 3.3 grams every other day. But again, for some reason, they only did six doses over 12 days, which is far shorter than humans use it for. Again, the results? Super weird. Honestly, they make no sense. The tumors in both the treated here and the untreated groups plateaued at these odd levels and stayed steady. And it seemed to show a slowing of tumor growth with the treatment, but none of the tumors shrank or disappeared. Now, it's really odd. Somehow the tumors in the untreated mice got 100 times bigger in three days, which is impossible, but then they just stopped growing for the next eight days and held steady while the tumors in the fenbendazole-treated mice neither grew nor shrank, but just held steady from the first place. The model was flawed. Using partially immunocompromised mice with human cell lines gives an unpredictable rejection feature. You can't really interpret them. So most researchers consider this kind of study unreliable, both due to the bad model, and in this particular case, the data that don't follow any of the known biology of these systems. If you want to implant human cell lines into mice, they have to be completely non-functional in terms of immune systems, like the Nodskid Gamma or NSG mice. Those do work. These mice, the nude mice, don't. So study three, done in 2023. This is the highest quality in many ways. It's a good quality mouse study. This one used the gold standard model for this type of work, as close to the human situation as possible. It used mouse cancer cells, in genetically matched mice with normal immune systems. So you can get the cancer cell line stressed and have the mouse's immune system recognize it and kill it off. This is as close to the human situation as you get. They used injected doses and very large, so they pushed the system hard to see any efficacy, and they measured it very carefully. So, again, in dishes, the fenbendazole slowed the cancer cell line and killed them at reasonable doses, very sensitive cell line. In real mice, again, just three injections over six days, but with these huge doses, the equivalent of two grams per dose by injection. What happened? Standard chemotherapy killed the tumors as expected, but there was no difference at all between the fenbendazole treated and untreated animals. None. Not even a delay or a slowing of growth as seen in the previous study. Okay, study number four was done this year, May 2025. It's another one of these flawed models, but it's a different type. It's cervical cancer in the same partially immunocompromised mice. So you have the same rejection problem, but this one mimics cervical cancer. The dosing was done by mouth and daily for 23 days. Okay, by mouth, longer period, this is good. Much better approximations of the way people report taking fenbendazole. But again, the doses were very, very large. They gave two different kinds of doses. First one they selected was the equivalent of 4.2 grams every single day, and the other one was twice as much, 8.4 grams every single day. Huge amounts. Now, again, there's some evidence that the tumor growth slowed, maybe up to 50% with that highest dose, but it didn't halt tumor growth or cause them to shrink or disappear, as patient stories claim, not in any one of these circumstances. Okay. Last one, study five, again, 2025. Still using the flawed nude mouse model, and this is back to the non-small cell lung cancer cell line model, human cells. They used enormous daily doses, 15 times higher than the Tippins protocol, plus an unapproved metabolic toxin. In this study, they were really looking at combinations of drugs. So the fenbendazole was dosed in food, good, and for the longest window, 60 days every single day, the doses were large. They were the equivalent of 3.3 grams each day. This is 30 plus times what people take. The result, fenbendazole alone showed a slight slowing of tumor growth. Not much, but a little. It did not shrink or eliminate tumors. Only combinations with the toxic metabolic drug had any real noticeable effects. And that drug is not legal for human use. 
You cannot take it. It's quite dangerous. So the bottom line here, why is fenbendazole a bad cancer treatment? Reason one, it barely enters the body when taken orally, and it takes doses 20 times or more what most people take in order to reach study levels. Reason two, the effective concentrations for the promising looking cell line results are unreachable in humans, even by injection. Reason three, in every high quality animal study, at best, it slows tumor growth. And in two out of five, it shows no effect at all. Reason four, we already have real proven drugs that work via the same mechanism, safely, effectively, with dosing that we understand and can control and side effects that we can manage and control. And reason five, the only self-reported semi-verified case involved a powerful immunotherapy that really does cure some people. Similarly, many people who claim that it cured them have also been on standard of care treatment at the same time, which can have significantly delayed effects. People don't realize that please see our episode on some of the issues with these types of testimonials. People are telling their truth, but they may not realize very important things. So fenbendazole is a great drug for deworming dogs, but for treating human cancer, the science says no. What people report can't be replicated in the lab even under the best possible conditions. Look, cancer can be terrifying, and it makes sense that people will look for hope wherever they can find it. But hope should be built on evidence, not anecdotes. If you want to explore alternative treatments, or clinical trials, or drug repurposing, talk to an oncologist, or just keep following our content. There are excellent drug repurposing studies that make far more sense and have very solid support. I'll be talking about two of those in the next couple of episodes. There are real breakthroughs happening, but fenbendazole is not one of them let me know what other medical myths or trending treatments you want broken down next. Thank you for watching and stay curious. Beyond these videos, if you need more personalized guidance or a deeper dive into specific treatments to have your treatment be as effective as possible, I offer one-on-one -on -one sessions and medical advocacy. I'm also in the process of developing an exclusive video series that breaks down each cancer treatment and drug in detail, along with interferences to avoid and ways to optimize for the ideal results. You can find information on both of these resources on our website, which is linked down below. Again, if you found this video informative, please give it a thumbs up, click the notification bell, and subscribe to our channel for more science-based cancer insights.